Hi, and welcome to module three of lecture two. In this and the next module, we're going to take a step back and go over some mathematical foundations corresponding to probability and to distributions, respectively. All the stuff I said the first time we took a little break to talk about a mathematical foundation still applies here. That is, there are multiple goals of doing this. One is to help you understand better the material in this course, and the other is to give you a firmer footing for future work. And again, as well, um, we're only going to touch on the surface of these important topics, and these are very, very important topics, um, more important than the vectors previously, honestly. Um, and if you want to go further without taking a full course, you can look at the Math Camp videos that are on this YouTube channel as well. Lecture 7 covers probability, Lecture 8 and 9 cover distributions in much more detail than we're going to do here in these two short modules. Okay, so all that said, um, let's begin by discussing what probability is. The kind you're probably most familiar with is the kind that tends to appear in games and in um, everyday sort of conversation, objective probability. So if I flip a coin, a fair coin, I have a half chance of getting heads and a half chance of getting tails. Those are objective probabilities because I have half a chance of each. Um, and the half chance comes from the nature of the coin flip, the physical nature of that. Um, if I roll a, a fair die, a six-sided die, I have a one in six chance of getting each number on the die. Again, these are objective probabilities because they're determined by the nature of the physical process, like rolling a die or flipping the coin. Um, objective probabilities are attached to the notion of, of truth, right? We know that the truth is there's a one six chance of, e of getting each um, of getting each number on the die. And that's fine. And we're going to be talking a lot about objective probabilities and how to sort of combine probabilities of events and outcomes together to, to assign objective probabilities to, to the chance certain outcomes occur. But there's also a kind of probability you probably end up using more often than objective probability in your lives, and that's subjective probability. This kind of probability is relates to your beliefs about the probability that some action or actions occur, or that some outcomes occur. So your subjective um, beliefs indicate how all the things you know, your, your prior beliefs, your, the, um, your experiences in the world, how they all come together to help you form some beliefs about the possibility that something happens. These are subjective because they might not be true in any larger sense. You might not accurately have perceived the true probability that any event happens. Despite that, we care a lot about them because we don't have access usually to the true probabilities for things other than say rolling a die or flipping a coin. Instead, we form our own beliefs for probabilities and these beliefs are what drive our, our behavior. So if I think there's a one third chance of a really good outcome happening and a two thirds chance of a bad outcome happening, if I were, if I'm a politician and I were to enact some policy, um, I'm gonna make a very different decision than if I think there's a three quarters chance of a really good outcome and a one quarter chance of a bad outcome. But neither of those can, might have anything to do with the truth, which might be there's no chance of a good outcome, <laughs> right? Um, the truth is not accessible by me, it's not able to be accessed by me, and therefore I must rely upon my subjective beliefs. So in a lot of what we do when, form, when, when writing theory, particularly formal theory, we lay out explicitly individuals' subjective beliefs and we use those to determine what actions they will take when trying to predict behavior. Okay. Subjective probability also comes up in a way when talking about um, a branch of statistics called Bayesian statistics. And Bayesian statistics involves, in a very loose sense, a prior belief over the distribution of some variable. This prior belief is not necessarily grounded in anything empirical. It could just be a prior belief. Um, and then you take that prior belief and update it with additional information you might get. This information may be true or false, um, but it's information you obtain and you use it to, to update your prior belief to some posterior belief. And that posterior belief is a distribution over possible values of an outcome or event conditional on all the stuff that happened between the prior and the posterior. 
We're not going to discuss that at all, really, at this point. Um, but Bayesian statistics are, have become increasingly important in, under, in, in statistical methods used in the social sciences. So it's, it's useful to have a sense of what they are and where to go looking for more um, if you see things that involve Bayesian statistics. Okay. Um, the second really big point, besides what is probability, is the notion of randomness. At several points in this course so far already, we've discussed at length how it's really important that most of our, th our theories in, in political science and social science are probabilistic. We're not saying we know for sure this will happen every single time. We're saying as X increases, on average, Y will increase. These are probabilistic statements. Similarly, empirically, another discussion we had of samples and, and, and um, populations, the sample, all the sample measurements we took, like X bar, like the sample mean and sample standard deviation, these were all um, random variables. And the reason is, even though the population may be fixed, each time we draw a sample, we're drawing a sample at random. Therefore, any calculations we, we perform on that sample, like calculating its mean or standard deviation, um, are going to vary by the sample we, draw, we drew. Because of that, those calculations, those measures, those, those, those parameters that we calculated are random variables. And that randomness, that fundamental randomness in all of our parameters is going to drive all the um, statistical inference that we do going forward. So understanding deeply that these things are random variables, they can take different values, um, is important. In a lot of ways, the fact that our sample mean is a random variable is no different than saying that the role of a die is a random variable. Right? We don't know what it is ahead of time until we actually realize the random variable's outcome. Same thing with the sample mean. We don't know what the sample mean will be beforehand until we realize the calculation of the sample mean because there is inherent randomness involved in this. Another word for randomness is stochasticity. It relates to a whole large theory of math and stats called stochastic processes. We're also not going to touch on this really here, except to say that a stochastic process is a very useful way of conceptualizing the world in which you have a series of states, um, say war and peace, or a Democrat um, winning an election or Republican winning an election, and, the and you assign probabilities both to staying in the state you are at each period of time or it, to transition between states, going from war to peace or peace to war, and so on. If this um, stochastic process is applied to any situation like that, which you can, which you can lay out transitions um, within and between states. And they're very useful for understanding a lot of different processes in the world. Okay, That's the um, more general stuff. Now for the rest of this module, we're going to focus on more specific details of probability. And those be related to the three different things. Um, outcomes are just outcomes. They're things that could happen in the world. Right? In this case, they're, th they're, they're values that a random variable could take. In the case of a sample mean, the outcomes, the outcomes that it could take are, are very large, potentially. Um, the mean could be anything from sort of very low down um, in the range of values in the population to very high up in the range of the values in the population, depending on how big the sample is and how lucky you got in terms of what um, elements of the population you drew, what you need to drew to be part of your sample. A sample space is the set of all possible outcomes that the random variable could take. Okay. Events are really of two types. There are simple events, which are just outcomes, right? Things that could happen from a random variable. Compound events, however, are multiple, of, are multiple outcomes that happen together um, either an, with an and, so a logical and means they both happen, like if outcome A happens and outcome B happens together jointly, or maybe or, a logical or, so A happens or B happens. Um, events are just combinations of outcome, compound events are just combinations of different outcomes or combinations of different events themselves. In all cases, we are primarily interested in the probability of the occurrence of some outcome. That's our main interest here, right? How likely it is, is it that a particular outcome or a particular event occurs? Because that's going to drive our statistical inference, 
but also on the theoretical side, our, our um, discussion of, of how one behaves based on what beliefs one has about the world, which can be formed by the probability that any given thing happens, okay, or is likely to happen in the future. Right? I make my decisions about how I spend my money based on how I expect to have money in the future. Okay, um, now, so those are the general definitions. Now moving on to some, a little bit of math, but not much. Um, probabilities and how to represent them. So I'm going to start over um, here with just probability, probability occurrence. We often represent as either a PR of some event A or just a P of some event A. I'm going to use the former here, the first one in everything below. A here is an event. It can be anything from who wins an election to the chance of a coin flip. Right? It's just any event that you can think of could be an A here. And the probability of A it is the chance that, that that A event happens given some constraints, given some time frame or whatever. That's all specified in the question itself. And you might have different probabilities of an event happening if you ask if the event will happen in a year or a day. That's fine. You would specify it ahead of time. And the actual event A would be that something happens within a year or that something happens within a day. Those are different events A. Okay. Um, independent events are two events whose probabilities don't influence the others. So if, if events A and B are independent, events A and B are independent, then the probability, um, they both happen, um, that, that each happens is independent of the other. I'm gonna take a break here before writing here to skip down to the fifth one for the moment to write joint probability. A joint probability is the probability that two or more events happen. We can write that as A and B in words, which is the probability that event both A and B both happen, both those events occur, which is the same as writing the probability of A intersection B, or A um, and B. It's a different way of writing that. A little fast and loose with that, but um, probability of A and B. That upside down U here is, is an intersection. Um, it's looking at the situation in which both A and B happen, the overlap. If you remember any kind of things with like Venn diagrams, um, you might have learned in school way back when. Here's A, here's B. This shaded area is the A and B. And the chance, it's, it's the probability that both A and B happen. So A and B is, is, the, is the event in which A and B both happen, and the probability of A and B is the probability that both happen. Okay. Um, we often care about joint probabilities when we have more than one thing happening. Independent events are events in which the probability that two things happen is equal to the probability that the first one happens times the probability that the second one happens. So they're utterly independent of each other. If I flip two coins, the probability I get two heads is the probability I get, I get one head in the first one, which is a half, times the probability I get a head in the second one, which is also a half. So the probability of two heads is a quarter. If I have more than one way of getting those things, I can add them. So for instance, if I have, if I want to know the probability of getting one head and one tail, well, there's a one half chance of getting a head first, and then a one half chance of getting a tail second. So that probability is one quarter. There's also a one half chance of getting a tail first, and a one-half chance of getting a head second. So the probability of that combination is a quarter. And you add them up and you get one half. So you can also work, do that for, these ind for independent events. Um, a set of event events is mutually exclusive if they can't both happen. If they can't both happen, you have a situation in which A um, and B equals zero. There's no chance that both A and B happen. Um, now, so, that, so mutually exclusive is a thing we often brought up when talking about categories. We wanted our categories to be ex mutually exclusive, so you couldn't have situations in which, in which we took data and a person could be in more than one category at once. In this case, you're saying the probability that you're in one category and another category is zero. Okay. Um, we also talked about collective exhaustivity. Co collectively exhaustive means you must be somewhere, that's, that some set of events covers all the possibilities that you that might have happened to you. 
we can write that like this. So let's consider a set of events um, indexed by i. That means you have a series of events a sub i. So there's a1, a2, a3, a4, and so on to some an. If these are collectively exhaustive, then if we put them all together, which we can do by writing the union of all the ai, these are ors, so either a1 happens or a2 happens or a3 happens or so on, then the probability that one of these things happens, at least one at least, at least one of these things happens, is one. So if I put all these a together and you know you're in one of one of these events happen, then you're guaranteed, sorry, if, if you have all these events and you say these collective, they're collectively exhaustive, then you know that at least one of them happened. So if I ask you, did A1 or A2 or A3 or so on happen, you will say yes, because the chance that at least one of them happened is one. If these are collectively exhaustive and mutually exclusive, then you have a series of events of which only one can happen, but together, that's all the possibilities. That's what we often did for the categorical variables. We wanted to set up a series of choices such that you had to choose one of them. Um, one of them must apply to you, but only one applies to you. Okay. Um, so those are hopefully are, are reasonably intuitive. And if not, if you look at them a few times, that should be more intuitive. The last one is less so. So I say that for last, even though it's in some ways the most important. So a conditional probability is a probability that depends on something else. We write that like this. So the probability of A given B. So the probability, you can read that as the probability of A given that B happens, or the probability of A conditional on B's happening, or something like that. Um, these are conditional probabilities, and they're essential to everything we do. Um, what we mean by this is that A is not independent of B necessarily. The fact that you might be chosen for some, for some position in government might depend on who your relatives are. Ideally it wouldn't, but it might, right? So um, that B here might be who your relatives are, and A might be being chosen for government, and the probability of A given B um, might be very different from the probability of A independent of what B is. So there's lots of different ways to work through this. Um, we won't spend too much time in this class going through that, but you will spend a lot of time on this if you go on, particularly in graduate school, because it comes up a lot. So one definition of this is it equals the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. So what that's saying is that I take the probability, the joint probability of them both happening and divide by the probability of B happening by itself. I personally find it a little easier to think about it if I multiply both sides by the probability of B. That gives me this. Probability of A and B equals the probability of A given B, of A conditional on B, times the probability of B. Now what is that? Well, that's saying that the probability of getting both A and B is the probability of A given that B happens times the probability that B happens. That makes sense in a way because if you want to know if both A and B happen and A depends on B, then first you have to have B happening, right? And then you look at the probability of A given that B happened. Right. So um, this is another way of writing it. In this case, if you don't care about the order of A and B, you can also just flip the A and B and write it like this. Now, obviously, if um, A happens before B or B happens before A in time, both of these don't make much sense. But you can write this out like this, and you can use that to write out a form of what's called Bayes rule that's used quite often, which is a way to flip the order of the conditionality in your calculations. And Bayes' rule is used very often, um, for instance, a very um, applicable uh, use right now, is understanding the degree to which medical tests are accurate. Right? 
Um, so you might want to know the chance that you're that you have a a, a um, some illness conditional on having a positive test, right? That's the important piece of information to you if you get a positive test. That's probably A given B. How do you calculate that? Well, you use Bayes rule right here. That's the probability of getting um, a positive test given that you have the virus, right? B given A, which is which is a fact, which is a parameter um, given to you by the sort of nature of the test. Then you multiply that by the pop by the probability in the population of having the virus, right? And then the probability of, of um, having a positive test overall, regardless of um, of, of whether or not you had the virus. And that will include both errors, both um, getting a positive result when you do have the virus and a positive result when you don't have the virus. Okay, um, And this kind of thing is used all the time. It's difficult because people don't always do a very good job of making these calculations by themselves in their head, um, but this is a way to, to optimally incorporate new information and understand how, for instance, tests inform individuals. So conditional probabilities are, are essential. We're going to be going back to this when we talk about um, ordinary least squares regression because regression effectively says, I want to understand the probability of getting a particular dependent variable conditional on a series of independent variables taking certain values. That's going to be probability of y given x, and that's going to be how my regression works. Right? Because y here is, a, is cause my dependent variable is a random variable. My independent variable is a random variable. And I want to know what the chance is of seeing my particular particular outcome given the set of independent variables I have. So that'll come up there as well. Okay. That covers the probability introduction. In the next module, we'll discuss the closely related topic of distributions. Thank you very much.